Okay, in this section we're going to look at the uh, front thrust kick. In the Wing Chun system, we've got kicks that are mainly close range, and they're all working really from waist downwards. So we obviously we covered the low side knee kick. In this section, we're going to look at the front thrust kick. Okay, now we're going to look at from the horse, from the uh, arrow stance from here to give us our, our balance and our, our stability here. And the kick is executed by bringing the knee and then thrusting forward and kicking with the heel. Guard hands always protective, the upper gates. And the common thing is when we kick, is that when we kick, if, if for example our support leg, the toes come up. So if you're looking on the side, this will happen. If I'm kicking like this, my body lifts up, I'm on my toes. The other thing that normally happens with students when they kick, they lean back. Okay, so even though they're solid and they're strong base, but they're leaning back to kick. So the, the energy now is going in two directions. So when we, when we ex actually execute the kick, knee comes up first, and the most important thing with any kick to get to the target is the speed the foot leaves the floor to the target area. So it's about bringing up and thrusting forward. Now, we're kicking with the heel, so the important thing is when we, when we kick, make sure the toes come back. A bit like a heel strike, so palm heel strike, so pull the toes back. Okay, so if you look at it from the side, when we're kicking, coming off the front, we're pulling the toes back, kicking with the heel. The other, obviously, the other thing that you will notice is that there's no upper body movement, so there's no bopping. No telegraphing, so we're not actually, as we move, lifting the body up, warning your opponent that you're going to kick. So everything stays flat. So it doesn't matter if you move, you kick, these don't move up and down, nor lean back or lean forward. So if I bring out Richard, just to demonstrate the target area, okay? In the wing chun, like we said earlier, all the kicks are sort of here, downwards. Okay, so if the front thrust kick was coming here, I would be looking at striking into the hip area here. Okay, so I'd be looking, striking in here or into the rib cage. And if I was on the inside gate, I'd be looking then into the bladder, stroke groin. Okay, we haven't got no high kicks. So, the other thing is important to remember that I will not kick if I'm out of range. How we gauge a range is if I can make contact. If I can make contact, I can kick. If I'm too far out here, could I kick him? I could, might have to take two or three steps to get in. Uncertainty. So make sure I can make contact, I can kick. Okay, now if we just bring the uh, shield, we'll just give you an idea of how we kick. Incorrect kick, leaning back on our toes. It creates a balance loss there. So we're losing power really from weakness here. So what you want to do is root yourself down, get yourself in position, knee comes up, thrusting forward, thrusting forward, thrusting forward. And the important thing with a kick is not actually trying to push your opponent away. It doesn't make it a good kick. The most important thing about kicking is that you can get your power into the target. Okay, so the idea is as you kick and also you have control. So I kick, I can place my foot down. So I'm not kicking and out of position. So as I kick, place it down. I can kick and place it down. Okay, that's the uh, front thrust kick. the uh, side chop. Okay, now with the Wing Chun upper body strikes, we've looked at the center line punch, we looked at the side punch, and we looked at the palm heel strike in the earlier video. Now we're gonna look at the chop. Now the chop is executed with the side of the hand here. Okay, so what we're actually doing as we push forward, fingers are held together, and we give this wrist a gentle striking forward and keeping the wrist 
away from. So we're drawing it and out. Now the elbow locks, okay, and the power is coming from the wrist and the elbow. Okay, now the chop we're looking from here is on the 45 degree turn, striking forward. Okay, and if we look at it from the side, if we're doing the chop to the side, we're moving to the side here and striking through. To the side, striking through. Okay, and if I just bring Richard out. And we'll look at some target areas. So what we want to do now is look at where we chop. Obviously, we, this is designed to go into the throat region here. Right, so as we strike him through, and also the side of the neck. So if I'm striking, I could be chopping in the neck or in the throat. Okay, so they're the areas that we're looking at. Right? So we won't really chop someone on the nose, okay? but we will certainly be looking into these soft areas here. Okay, so if we just look at the pad now, we'll give you an idea where we're striking and the type of energy we actually employ in the strike. So first thing, is, as a training tool, the first thing you want to look at is that we're generating a power from the wrist. So if I place my fingers on the target, i.e. if I was doing it on a sandbag or, or in this case on, this, on the pad, what I'm doing is making sure my wrist turns here. Okay, so if I do this on a 45, it gives you an idea that the chop is actually penetrating into, into the actual pad. So that, if you can imagine the, the energy crushing into the, the trachea here, or into the throat. So the idea is you get a good, heavy, solid chop. Okay, that's the uh, side chop. This section now when we look at some blocks. First block we look at is jump sail. Jump sail means sinking elbow block. Okay, so if we look at it from our hall stance here, guard hand forward, if I'm going to execute the block from my Wu Sao hand, what happens is the elbow stays low, pushes forward through my center and across my center with a slight rotation here. Okay, that's your deflective force within the region here. So we're coming forward and across. Okay. Now the common mistake with this jump sail block is many students will chop right across and if that's happening this gate is exposed. So from here what we're doing even on the 45 degree turn I cover across. Okay. So I'm looking if my guard hand is here and I'm being tacked on this side I'll cut across here. If I'm being tacked on this outside here I will cut across here. Okay, so we're looking at how we execute the, the block coming forward. Okay, and the target area of the block is just here, yeah, and the, the side of the, the wrist here. All right, so we're coming in, and the contact area is there. Okay, so if I just bring out Richard, just to give you an idea what happens when we, when we actually go through this. Now, the incorrect method of blocking is what many students do because all they worry about is this is going to hit them so they want to get out of the way but what this does opens up this gate here so rather than punch come you're chopping down and exposing all this the correct method is that when that punch comes I'm just moving across and I haven't actually exposed anything now so if the next punch comes through I'm punching and blocking across so as he comes cross across now if you just watch if I just get Richard now, if he just follows through, it's gone past. All right, so I don't need no more extra movement with this. Okay, so when the punch comes, if I do it on turn, what I'm actually doing is actually 
deflecting, if you look, as I, as I make contact, I'm deflecting here. All right, so when the punch comes, I deflect. And I've still got my protection. All right? I haven't exposed and left this gate for an attack. Okay, so when the punch comes, we're looking very simply here. And in a good way to look at this, if, if for example, if Richard was coming in with a punch here, and I've blocked in this position here, I'm still in line, look, to punch through. Okay, whereas if I would have done it incorrectly, I'm out of, I'm out of position. Okay, I've left the gate open, I'm now out of position. So the important thing is, is to block, and I'm still in here to, to strike through. Okay, and that covers the jump sound. And the next block we're going to look at is gung sao. Now, the gung sao is a low sweeping block, and it's covering the gates here. Now we're looking is the low abdomen here and the rib cage either side. Okay, so it's, it's a sweeping block out, and obviously anything that's coming through the center off here. We are still blocking now on the underside of the arm, still with the rotation as all the Wing Chun blocks work with. Okay, so we're going to be looking anything that's coming, this gate, this mid gate here, we're going to be sweeping away here. If I just use it as a block, you get an idea. It's the rotation and the drive and the sweep away from the attack. So you make contact and then you're driving it away with the rotation here. Okay, the important thing is if you're blocking a kick, is to make sure the fingers are not in, in contact with. Okay, so what you'll find is all the blocks follow the, the hands follow the same line of the arm. Okay, so they don't have any deviation like so. so if I'm coming from the high gate here, sweeps, fingers away. Okay, and I'm blocking with the underside of the arm like so. So what I'm doing is pushing forward and around here. Okay, so what we'd like to do now is just bring out Richard to demonstrate some points here. So what we're going to look at now is if we're looking at a hooking type movement here, as it comes round, I'm blocking like so. So as the next one comes, I'm through here. Now, the important part is that with all the blocks and strikes is timing. So I'm, I'm actually learning to time as that hook comes round, is to block it and meet it so. So as it comes through, here, here. Okay, so I'm learning to just rotate through. My block, as the next one comes through, comes through my center and away, all right? Doesn't take it too far away, again, exposure of gates, okay? So the common mistake is a lot of people make as their hook comes around is a straight arm, okay? If you're blocking a kick with a straight arm, you'll find you'll do a lot of damage to it. So rather than just chopping away like so, you'll do damage if you're blocking a kick, you'll more likely break your arm. The idea is, is to rotate, okay? Again, if it's coming through the center, okay, the straight line, we're still looking at the same movement. Coming through. Okay, so it's meeting it through here. So whether it's a circular movement or a straight line. So if this was executed like a front punch here, and it, or even if there's a kick coming in that gate, we're sweeping away, striking through. That's gung sao. The okay, next block we're going to look at is Bong Sao, one of the most common blocks in the Wing Chun system, the wing arm block. Okay, again, block is relying on the rotation of the arm. And what the key areas that we will need to look at in, with this block 
Again, we're blocking with this part here, the underside and the top of the wrist coming in. Elbow is always higher than the wrist. So the common mistake what people do is flat. Okay, and the danger with that is it becomes like a bar arm and it starts to become weak there. The other problem is with bong sao, people think it's a yielding and it's soft and it's relaxed and everything else. It's bong is a forward block. It pushes forward. It's not here. Anything here, and we'll show you later on, you'll just get hit. So the idea is, is to search forward. Okay, the elbow higher than the wrist, fingers slightly looking across and down, fingers still together so they're not splayed out like so. So here, we're pushing forward here. And we also have the wheel cell just behind the wrist here. And there's a reason why, which we will discuss when we come to the practical use of. Okay, so the bong cell. Trying to keep the body relaxed, try not to lift the shoulders up too high. And we're blocking an, a, a, an attack that's coming at this uh, level here, the face. So we don't lift it up. We've got to rely on the rotation to deflect the punch away. Okay, and so if you're using it with a turn, it will also allow you that angle and that position. So what we're going to get you to do, what we're going to look at now is bring out Richard and we can demonstrate. Okay, so let's, let's just look at the bomb here. So as the punch is coming through here into my head region, as it comes through, as it's punching, I'm doing like this. Okay, so I'm turning. So if I stay square, this is my block, okay, without me lifting, my elbow is higher than my wrist, my fingers are looking away and down. But if I just get rigid just to push, carry on pushing through, what you find, you have this. The directory of the punch starts to move up. All right, so obviously as it's coming with speed, I'm using the turn and this rotation of the wrist. Common mistake is, as a punch comes, they're drawing in. They draw the punch in. Well, you're going to get hit. All right, because the angle is incorrect. So bong sao is actually a searching. It's out, it's long. Now if the force is so much greater, I can change. I can change that block into a tarn. Okay, I can learn to collapse it. Okay, so what we're going to get you to do also look at is when the punch is coming on a block, this rear guard, if this punch is still coming through, I've got a support hand to deal with the punch or coming in with lap and chop. All right, so as the punch comes, a bong. So the next punch comes, a bong. Okay, so the idea is you learn to rotate and not make your blocks as the punch comes too close to your own body where you're going to get hit and all, also too high, right? So the idea is any movement that has a clash, you're going to cause more damage to yourself. So the idea is to time the block and learn to create that rotation. So when a punch comes, here, here. It's a deflection, okay? So remember it comes from the, the, the crane movement, so the wing arm, so nothing can be done with any force. It's got to be done on deflecting and rotation and that covers the bong cell. Okay, now we're going to look at the second half of the ceiling towel form. So we're going to look at it from the, literally from the second half. Okay, so the hands are back here. First movement we're going to look at is coming down, rolling forward to the side and to the right side. Now the common mistake in what most beginners make, they keep it too close to their own body and also they lock out their arms. So the idea is the elbow stays remain bent and your power is coming from the wrist movement here. Okay, so when you're coming in, there's a whole rotation going on, and we're blocking or striking with the, the side of the hand. Okay, so we come one, two, through. The next movement we're going to do is drawing the elbows in. So again, a common mistake is elbows go out, which is incorrect. So the elbow's got to stay in, thrusting forward into the, or thrusting back, I should say, into with the heel of the hands, coming forward. And the key point here, left over right, is that we don't allow the arms to cut a, come right across here or stay out here. So 
best way to remember is that fingertips are in line with the elbow. Okay, left arm, shoulder gives you the direct the height. So we're not going to be up here because that means it's above the shoulder. So when we chop out, the right hand comes on top of the left. Again, still in line, blocking through. Now, rather when we come to this point here, when we draw back, it's only a slight draw. We don't draw all the way back here, as you'll see some students do. So draw it back here, strike, down, double finger jab. Nice and gentle through here. Fingers together and strike through. Now, when we come into the Paxan movement, it's not here. It's searching forward. Cut across, drop, side palm. And through. Tan, jump, tan, gun, tan, cross, retract, strike, and lift. Now, the common mistake is with this movement is that it's just wrist. People can come out and do this. It's wrong. Push it forward, and you've got to try and generate a power from your elbow and wrist, and with slight shoulder, because everything's done on the square. We've got to generate the power. Okay, so we come from here into the bongs out and tan. Again, does a slight trap and draw back and then thrusting forward into the midsection. So we're not going up high. So we block, pull, strike and lift. Block with the bongs out, draw back, strike and lift. Okay, we come through here and we crunch out, making sure this arm is now on top. And the, the key is in this movement that both hands rotate. Like so. Okay, so left arm goes out, sweep, and sweep. Now you've got the right hand now, prime for the punch, close, and push, and relax. That's the second half of your ceiling towel.
okay, we're now going to look at the circling steps, okay, so we're looking at it from the uh, hall stance, okay, I'm going to keep my hands out of the way, but we're going to get you to just see how we perform the circling steps around and move in in the circular motion through and then back, okay, so now the idea of the circling step and the circling stepping when we come to that is, is basically we're closing off and protecting the lower gates so we don't have no low hand work so everything that we're doing is the knee protects and we circle into a leg so if a leg if I leg lock someone here and I want to move through to the other gate for whatever reason I'm going to circle out to move back in okay so if you're doing it in your training dr drills at home you will be moving with a combination of upper hand work in harmony and, and coordination with the footwork okay so we're going to look at the, um, the circling in this format with uh, Richard just to give you an idea what we mean so say the example is Richard just got his guard forward and I'm in this position here when I turn I want to make sure that this gate is not open. So if Richard lifts his leg up now, it, or just a straight leg, in, it leaves this go, gate open here. So the idea is, as I turn, if he lifts his leg and pushes through, I'll protect my lower gate. Now, I'll circle in. Now this is the point next stage, because when students come through and they just want to do this to get open, but you expose this gate. So what we do is we circle around. Rather than being clumsy and falling over the legs, we actually circle around and in. Okay, so when we're in this position here, the most important thing is to get the feet to move in a circular motion. Okay, so what we're going to get you to look now is if I was in a stance here and I was leg locked into Richard or circled in, if your opponent now starts to move away, I can circle in and follow through. So we just look at it from a, so here I have circled, I've moved in, they're moving away, circle in and keep that pressure onto them, okay? And that's the general uh, idea of your circling steps, but we're looking at it actually working through uh, in, in the air now. Okay, let's have a look at the circling steps in advancing forward. So I'm in my position here, What's going to happen here, I've circled my front and moved through. Right? And what you've got to imagine, there's a leg that you're connecting with that you need to circle out and into. Okay? So the idea is when you're moving forward, it doesn't matter which leg you've got forward, but if there's a contact leg, you're, you're circling out and in. And you're protecting the lower gate as you're circling through. Because if you watch, as I move forward here, this knee comes in and protects the gate through. Okay, so that would be your advanced circling steps. Now we come to a block where we call juts out and again this block actually is covering low to middle gate now so we're looking at something that's coming in between like the stomach or even the bladder region now the hand the, the part of the hand we actually block with is just the heel okay just this part here juts out jerk hand all right so the idea is what the, the common mistake with this, this particular block people thrust down and we'll show you in the practical sense why that would not work in, this, in, 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 the, in the practical way. So the idea is what we mean by jerk hand is actually the block is coming back into your own body and jerks down. Fingers looking up slightly, thumb again on the side here, so it's not in to make any contact here. And we're blocking with the heel of the hand. 
Okay, obviously it'd be accompanied with an attack of sorts. Okay, so blocking here. Again, we're keeping it away from the body. So we, if we block here, it means you've been hit or you're going to be hit. So the idea is we're bridging back, elbow stays out and block. And the elbow still remains out, hand is in the center. We're blocking back, fingers looking and jerking back and down. Okay, and if I just bring Richard out, just to illustrate this particular movement, what actually happens is this. When the strike is coming through, if I'm trying to just block it down, it's going to be a hit and miss. Okay, I may get it, I may get it on top, or I may totally miss. And that means it's still going to come through. The idea is, is as I block, I've got this jerk going on here. And again, because of the, I haven't got a flick or a, a, a rotation with the arm, but I've got to use the wrist to create the deflection. If you watch, it doesn't matter how firm he holds it, it's got this movement going in a downward here. And if you look, it's a nice little fit in the heel of the hand down. Now, if you look what's actually happening, when he punches, when I block here, that's how far it's away from my body. So I'm actually coming back and then down. And not just down, or nor just back. Okay, so it's a mixture of the two. Okay, and it's designed to this level. It's no good up here. Okay, so it's, it's really designed that anything that's coming low, as the next punch comes in, you're covering here. And I'm covering the gate. So if you watch, as that punch comes in, my elbow stays out, and I strike him through. And that's the basics of your juts out. We're now going to look at a, a strike that is not common, okay, but what we're going to look at is in the sense of the, the finger jab, as opposed to the punch and the chops. This is the other open hand strike that we have, okay, so now the finger jab, obviously, the strength of your fingers are going to account for a lot, okay, so because we're only going in soft areas, throat and eye, so the, the, again, when we're jabbing forward, the fingers are held together, so that gives you the strength. Thumb is to the side and locks in, also adds to the strength. Now, the most important thing with a finger jab is your longest strike, upper body strike you've got. All right, so if you look from here to here, it's longest. And if you turn with it, it extends here. It's also one of your fastest because of the, the contraction and relaxation states. So when you're here and you punch, you've got to contract all the muscle groups and then relax. Whereas here, you're just moving forward and then at the very point, creating the tension or the firmness, if you like, because of the way you've put the fingers together. So, if I just bring out Richard now, what I want you to do now is just to look at the target areas where we're striking. So, we look, soft areas here, mainly it will be the eyes, because here it's still quite you know, firm, but we can tack into certain parts of the throat, into the here, but certainly the eyes, we will be striking through. Okay, and obviously that you can see what that will create and cause. So again, if we just quickly get a pad, and we just give you an idea on something soft and light to practice on, to see if your fingers, one, don't crumble and collapse, okay? And secondly, you know, they don't bend back, all right? So the importance here is the firmness, okay? And all your additional training, really, right from your first form, circling in, grip, is all adding to power. And obviously, you've been shown various exercises to strengthen this area of your fingers. So, again, we just have a, a general idea of where your finger jab is coming from. Thrusting forward, okay, we're looking at the eye region. Again, you need to be very accurate with this, so if I just put this down for a second. There's no point in me thinking, going for fingers and hitting his cheekbone. So the idea is I have to be very accurate of where I'm going. If it's a throat, I've got to be accurate. If it's the eyes, 
I need to be accurate in that sense as well. Because, again, it's not like a punch. I can afford to hit any hard area. But with the finger jab, I have to be very accurate. And that's the, the basics of the finger jab. Okay, we're now going to come and look at the sandbag training. Now, the sandbag is used for many reasons, okay, other than just working with your form and training, say, like the punch, it's actually teaching you the correct power development. So we're looking at penetrating into the bag as opposed to surface hit. We're also looking at the correct alignment of the punch. So if, if I'm punching and the angle's incorrect, something will give. Okay, the conditioning process, that's really more to do with like your knuckles here, the bottom three, teaching you about the correct folding and locking up of the fist, so we're not punching half open, which would damage the knuckle and the hand. Okay, we're not grazing the bag, so it's teaching us the correct alignment and penetrating through. Also the range, so we're not too far away and punching at the wrong distance. Now the important thing that you have to remember with the sandbag training is that we never actually punch full range. Okay, so we actually punch. When we punch, our elbow is still bent. That means we've still got some more to go. Okay, but you're going to be stopped. Stopped by the bag, We're not allowing you to go through. But you're going to penetrate through the punch. And we only tighten up at the very end of. So as soon as I touch, everything tightens up and then we relax. Now obviously it's not just punching. We do chops. So here we can look at doing the side chop. And again, the common mistake with the side chop is people doing this, as opposed to, a bit like what we said earlier, fingertip. Okay, and it'll give you the area of contact. Palm heel. Side punch. Okay, it just gives you ways of training the technique. Okay, so just quick uh, summary of create alignment. Okay, so positioning, elbow, shoulder, nice and relaxed. Create alignment of the, the wrist so it's not bent and can give and, and create uh, injuries to your to the to the wrist. Bottom three knuckles if you're punching. So we're looking at the correct tightening of the hand, creating the fist with the thumb on the out correct flatness of the, the fist so we don't actually take the impact in that, in that direction which will co cause injuries and again if we're chopping looking at the area that we're targeting fingers away because if you chop with the fingers you'll end up breaking those so learning to turn and getting the wrist out of the get the fingers out of the way by using the wrist and then targeting through same with the palm heel getting the heel of the hand in, fingers pulled back, thumb on the out, just pushing through. And that, continue, that gives you the basic idea of how we perform the basic training on the sandbag. And now we're going to look at the sandbag form. And that's the sandbag form.
going to come to the section now in the Wing Chun, is what we call the locking system. Okay, so we're going to look at wrist locks. Now, Wing Chun is not a locking style. So all the locks that we're talking about is they're executed and then they're moving on into the next technique, whatever that is. Okay, but the locks are going to be used for various reasons. Either you're transporting an individual to a place or getting them out of the way, or you're using them to restrain them, or even disarming. Okay, so we don't like to fiddle around and hold on to people's arms and you know, trying to sort of hold on to them when there's more than one that may be attacking you. So what we're going to do is just quickly give you some uh, guidelines. So let's just pull Richard out. We look at the locks here. Now, when we look at the wrist locks, we're talking about um, if you're being grabbed here. Obviously, in the wing chain, the first thing we look at is always exposing and attacking the areas because all he's done is tied up on hand. Okay, he's got a hand free, two legs free, I've got a hand free. But as soon as the grip comes, I will strike. But if it's still grip there, I will trap here to stop him from escaping. And this is the key area. And that's why in the, in the ceiling towel, we do a lot of wrist turn uh, circling. Is that when the grip comes, I pull them off balance, stop them from kicking. I'm going to draw and drive down here and slightly forward. And that's what creates the pressure into the wrist. All right, so it's not a forceful power orientated, I trap, pull them off so they've got nothing else to think about, i.e. kicking, I'm going to trap in and apply pressure. Now, I can let go and strike, it's very simple, but I've created enough damage into the wrist here. One of the other locks I want to look at here is if it's the same side. Again, this principle is always working. Tarn sail to open up here, get your fingers across there, and now what I'm going to use is a short jerk movement here, thumb is controlling, cross the small finger here, and then I'm going to put pressure coming into the wrist and then down. The common mistake with wrist control and, and wrist locks is that the pressure is not correctly applied. Okay, so if we look at it from this point again, when I trap here, we'll give you another way of looking at it. The point is I've got to try and get my wrist in line with his wrist and then I've got to put pressure. Once I've cut in, I've got to put pressure down. Now the common mistake what a lot of people do is they go down and then wonder why it's not working. The idea is, as I block in here, I stay up, they go down, okay? And it's the pressure you put on. Again, you can release and strike through. Like we said earlier, Wing Chun is not a, a locking system. We don't like to be tied up for too long. Okay, if we look at it from, say, for example, uh, it could be a double grab. It doesn't matter, but the thing is here, first thing I will be looking at is getting them away from. Weakening the grip by turning slightly, so he really grips, Turn to create a breathing space for me, give me my full range with a palm heel strike, and then coming in here and the back of the hand. So if you just we look here, what I'm actually doing is fingers in, pushing into, the, into their own joint, and then giving it a sharp jerk around. So what you actually have is going in and against the joint, okay? and that's what creates the break and the snap here, all right? So we're going in and then snap. And again, look at the line of the body, falls into, into the punches and strikes. Okay, so if we look at that one again, doesn't matter which way you're coming from, is here. And if it's still the same grab, I'm coming from inside. Now I've got the lock going into the joint, but now look, ideal for kicking, exposing and opening gates. Okay, so I've got control of the person. If they start to struggle, I can remove and get it in. Okay, and they're just some of the basic uh, wrist locks. Okay, we come now to one of the most important aspects in the Wing Chun, which we call Chi Sao. We're going to look at the basic Chi Sao, which we call Chi Dan Sao, or single hand stick. Now, the purpose of the Chi Sao is, is, is too numerous to uh, go through at this point, but we'll look at the basics. First of all, we're looking at correct technique alignment. We're looking at developing sensitivity and reaction. Okay, and obviously as we advance into the chi cell, then we're looking at becoming more combat based. Okay, but at this level, we're looking at correct technique, the alignment of our, our blocks and our strikes, and building up and developing basic sensitivity and reaction time. Now it's very important, the common mistake with uh, many Wing Chun students, they want to just race away and get into the combat stage. But we all need a foundation to work from. Okay, so what we're going to look at now is from the Chi Dan, I'll just demonstrate the basic blocks that we'll be looking at. 
working for you. So the first movement we'll be looking at is what is called bong sao. Obviously there'll be an arm that I'll be defending, but we're just going to look at the movements first. We come in from bong to tan to palm strike. And then we come back to bong, tan, palm strike. And the other side we'll be looking at be uh, jump sao, punch, fuk sao, jump, punch, fuk sao, and jump. So they're, they're the key movements. Okay, and like I said, actually what you're also developing here is what we call short distance power. Because all the movements are not working from long range. So when we, we block here, we block here, short range. When I punch, short range. Cling, stick, and feel. Okay, so to illustrate this with a bit more detail, if I just bring Richard. Okay, what we're going to get you to look, what we're going to look at here just come this way for is we're both in a horse stance. And the most important thing about the chi sao is that we must get our range because we end up doing chi sao like from here and nothing is practical. Punch doesn't reach and I can't reach them. So we need to be a level where we can reach and then we can test our blocks. So Richard is punching. This is my bong sao. I'm sticking. I come into time. This is what we call a neutral stage because nothing's happening. I'm not attacking. He's not attacking, but we're, we're at a point here. He's into his fox out. He's clinging on to me. I'm sticking also. Now, I'm going to go. He doesn't react. This is where the sensitivity comes into it. He doesn't react until he feels my palm delivered, being delivered. Now, he's, he's created a jump. He's deflected it. If that wasn't there, I can still hit. Just to give you an idea what he's done, he's deflected it. It's finished my power here. But now what he's going to do, he's going to punch. I'm going to react to the bomb with bong sao. We come back, he's gone into fuk sao and strike and he punches. And now what we do, we just base the technique on feeling. Okay, now if I want to change and I'm staying on the same arm, all I do is, as Richard comes into tan sao, okay, and the common mistake also what individuals make is that they're trying to put too much power in the punch. Okay, the idea is, once you're rooted in your stance, okay, we shouldn't be sort of moving around and flop. So it should be solid space. This is where your alignment position comes into. And then you just allow the techniques to flow through. Okay. Even one can change with the same arm. But if I want to change sides here, I'm going to deliver a punch, jump sails the block. So now he's going to punch. Now we're on the other side. If I just punch here, he jumps, and then we're back on this side. And if I want to change, I'll work through. And if Richard wants to change on the same arm, and away he goes. Okay, and this is a very important exercise. Developing power, correct positioning, correct angle, correct technique, and then feeling and reacting, okay, at this very basic level, developing a good strong stance, and also you will find th the shoulders will do a lot of the work, so when I'm bonging here, it strengthens key muscle groups, okay, and then common mistake again, don't bong up, bong forward, bong forward. And that 
is the basic cheetah.